we who in a formal or an informal way represent most of the free peoples of the world are met here tonight in the interests of the millions in all the nations who have freedom in their souls to let those millions in the other countries know that here in the United States are 130 million men, women, and children who are in this war to the finish. Our American people, until they can strike the relentless blows that will assure a complete victory and with it win a new day for the lovers of freedom everywhere on this earth. This is a fight between a slave world and a free world. Just as the United States in 1862 could not remain half slave and half free, so in 1942 the world must make its decision for a complete victory one way or the other. Down the years, the people of the United States have moved steadily forward in the practice of democracy. When the freedom-loving people march, when the farmers have an opportunity to buy land at reasonable prices, and to sell the produce of their land through their own organizations. When the workers have the opportunity to form unions and bargain through them collectively. And when the children of all the people have an opportunity to attend schools which teach them the truths of the real world in which they live. When these opportunities are open to everyone, then the world moves straight ahead. But through the leaders of the Nazi revolution, Satan now is trying to lead the common man of the world back into slavery and darkness. For the stark truth is that the violence preached by the Nazis is the devil's own religion of darkness. So also is the doctrine that one race or one class is by heredity superior and that all other races or classes are supposed to be slaves. In the march of freedom of the past 150 years has been a long drawn out people's revolution. In this great revolution of the people, there were the American Revolution of 1775, the French Revolution of 1792, the Latin American revolutions of the Bolivarian era the German Revolution of 1848, the Russian Revolution of 1918. Each spoke for the common man in terms of blood on the battlefield. Some went to excess, but the significant thing is that the people groped their way to the light. The people are on the march toward even fuller freedom than the most fortunate peoples of the earth have hitherto enjoyed. No Nazi counter-revolution will stop it. The common man will smoke the Hitler stooges out into the open in the United States, in Latin America, and in India. He will destroy their influence. No Lavals, no Mussolinis will be tolerated in a free world. The people, in their millennial and revolutionary march toward manifesting here on Earth, the dignity that is in every human soul, hold as their credo the four freedoms enunciated by President Roosevelt. We who live in the United States may think there is nothing very revolutionary about freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom from the fear of secret police. But when we begin to think about the significance of freedom from want for the average man, then we know that the revolution of the past 150 years has not been completed, either here in the United States or in any other nation in the world. We know that this revolution cannot stop until freedom from want has been attained. And now, as we go forward toward realizing the four freedoms of this people's revolution, I would like to talk about four duties. It is my belief that every freedom, every right, 
every privilege has its price, its corresponding duty, without which it cannot be enjoyed. The four duties of the people's revolution, as I see them today, are these. The duty to produce to the limit, the duty to transport as rapidly as possible to the field of battle, the duty to fight with all that is in us. The duty to build a peace, just, charitable, and enduring. The fourth duty is that which inspires the other three. We failed in our job after World War I, but by our very errors we learned much. And after this war, we shall be in position to utilize our knowledge in building a world which is economically, politically, and I hope spiritually sound. There must be neither military nor economic imperialism. Some have spoken of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering, the century which will come out of this war, can be and must be the century of the common man. If we really believe we are fighting for a people's peace, all the rest becomes easy. Production, yes. It'll be easy to get production without either strikes or sabotage. Production with a wholehearted cooperation between willing arms and keen brains. Enthusiasm, zip, energy geared to the tempo of keeping at it everlastingly day after day. Hitler knows as well as those of us who sit in on the war production board meetings that we here in the United States are winning the battle of production. He knows that both labor and business in the United States are doing a most remarkable job. I need say a little about the duty to fight. Some people declare, and Hitler believes, that the American people have grown soft in the last generation. Hitler agents continually preach that we are cowards, unable to use, like the brave German soldiers, the weapons of modern war. It is true that American youth hates war with a holy hatred. But because of that fact, and because Hitler and the German people stand as the very symbol of war, we shall fight with a tireless enthusiasm until war and the possibility of war have been removed from this planet. We shall cleanse the plague spot of Europe, which is Hitler's Germany, and with it the hellhole of Asia, Japan. The American people have always had guts and always will have. You know the story of bomber pilot Dixon and radio man Gene Aldrich and ordnance man Tony Pastola the story which Americans will be telling their children for generations to illustrate man's ability to master any fate. These men live for 34 days on the open sea in a rubber life raft eight feet by four feet with no food but that which they took from the sea and the air with one pocket knife and a pistol. And yet they lived it through and came at last to the beach of an island they did not know. In spite of their suffering and weakness, they stood like men with no weapon left to protect themselves and no shoes on their feet and walked in military file because they said, if there were Japs, we didn't want to be crawling. The American fighting men and all the fighting men of the United Nations will need to summon all their courage during the next few months. Convinced that the year 1942 will be a time of supreme crisis for all of us. Hitler, like the prize fighter, who realizes he is on the verge of being knocked out, is gathering all his remaining forces for one last desperate blow. The convulsive efforts of the dying madman will be so great 
that some of us may be deceived into thinking that the situation is bad at a time when it is really getting better. But in the case of most of us, the events of the next few months, disturbing though they may be, will only increase our will to bring about complete victory in this war of liberation. Spiritually prepared, we cannot be surprised. Psychological terrorism will fall flat. As we nerve ourselves for the supreme effort in this hemisphere, we must not forget the sublime heroism of the oppressed in Europe and Asia. There can be no half measures. No compromise with Satan is possible. We shall not rest until all the victims under the Nazi yoke are freed. We shall fight for a complete peace as well as a complete victory. The people's revolution is on the march and the devil and all his angels cannot prevail against it. They cannot prevail, for on the side of the people is the Lord. He giveth power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increaseth strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. 